Hey, good evening, and welcome to everyone who has joined us this evening for uh, our GFTU Trade Union and Working Class History session. My name's Gawain Little. I'm General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions, and it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, this evening's meeting. First of all, before I introduce our speaker for this evening, uh, just a little bit of housekeeping. We are currently in webinar format, so don't worry that you can't unmute yourself or switch your video on. Um, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, you will see several different options, including a chat button. You can use the chat to introduce yourself to everyone else, maybe say where you're joining from and to uh, engage in any discussion during the session. But there's also a Q&A box. Uh, while our speaker is talking today, if you'd like to put any questions you have for the speaker uh, in that Q&A box, just click on the Q&A. It will allow you to put questions in there. We'll be able to put those to our speaker today. I believe he may also have some questions for you. So we're hoping to get into a good bit of discussion back and forth around um, and about uh, Tom Mann. But without further ado, um, I'm going to introduce uh, today's speaker. So, Phil, I think you should now be able to switch video on. If you double check, I think we've now enabled that. Um, yes, fantastic. Well Excellent. Exactly. Welcome. I'm I love really, that. Good evening, everybody. Really, really pleased to be joined by um, this evening's speaker, um, author and lifelong trade union activist, um, Phil Katz. He's um, written a number of books about the trade union movement, about um, historic workers' struggles. Uh, he's been a member of the National Graphical Association, Southeast TUC Print Industry Committees during the print workers' strike at Wapping News International. And he's currently been touring Britain, talking about Tom Mann. Um, and not only Britain, but internationally. He's recently been on a tour of Australia at the invitation of the um, coal mining and manufacturing unions of Australia to speak all about uh, Tom Mann. But he's here today to speak to us about the same topic. So uh, without further ado, I'll hand over to our fantastic speaker and my good friend and comrade, um, Phil Katz. Phil, you're very welcome. And over to Thanks, you. Thanks, Gwen. Uh, it's lovely to be on the same platform as you again after uh, a few years. Um, I'd like to say good evening to everybody. Uh, it's going to be a very interesting event for me because um, it's quite different from the speaking tour I've been doing in across Britain and also uh, in Australia. Um, partly because uh, I suppose the meetings that we've been doing, uh, you have to explain an awful lot about Tom Mann. And um, they're rank and file activists, so that you're also trying to explain the trade union movement and quite a long stretch of history. Um, for example, last night I was in Coventry. It was Tom Mann's birthday. And Coventry was the place of his birth. So I spoke uh, to Coventry Trades Council and uh, various activists there. But I think this will allow us much more time to um, discuss in some more depth. Perhaps I'm hoping the contemporary trade union movement as well. Um, so uh, I'm going to talk to you about Tom Mann. And if there are terms that you hear, um, things that you want to know that you're not clear on, just feel free, as Gawain said, to, to use the technology. Um, and then I'll talk for about 20 minutes. Um, and from there, I think we can go into a series of questions. But don't just answer my questions. Come up with your own. Um, it's, an, it's an opportunity. So here's the book. Uh, you probably can't see it. Can you see it? Because it's a bit blurred. It's too blurred. Uh, do I unblur my screen? Do you want to know? We will find a way to unblur you now, and you. Can I think that's. I think that's down to me. There we go. There we go. This this is the book. Um, actually, there are a hell of a lot of books about Tom Mann, and I kind of welcome that. I don't see mine as being uh, um, eclipsing any others, but just part of the family. 
and uh, it's the first major book on Tom Mann in about 50 years. So uh, having a whole series of these books is a good thing because it allows uh, people like yourselves to look at his ideas and perhaps see a little bit of a reflection um, and to, to question uh, where we are now. So what I want to do tonight is just to very briefly describe the life of Tom Mann. The book actually isn't really a biography. It's a political biography of the evolution of his thinking. So I'm going to have to talk to you about the world that Tom was acting in uh, and how it changed over the course of his lifetime. I'd like to un uh, outline the sort of main contours of how his political thinking evolved over a pretty much a 60 year period. Um, and I, I'll, I'll say something about the major events and the conflicts that he was involved in. Um, and I'll also look at some of his concrete achievements, which are really many. Uh, I want to discuss his legacy, um, but I think trying to assess which of his ideas are still relevant. Um, and I think that's probably for you to discuss and to decide. And I'm going to do all that in 20 minutes. Uh, <laughs> I may struggle. So Tom was uh, essentially, uh, he was born in 1856, and he was essentially self-educated. Uh, he was born into extreme poverty, worked as an agricultural labourer, and then went down the coal mines at 10 years old. Um, and he was, uh, I think he went to school for about three years on what they called half-time education in those days. So uh, the, the, the schooling was uh, effectively designed around uh, the kind of work that the kids were doing. Um, he, he was involved in major disputes across continents. Uh, he was a big character. He's kind of acknowledged as the greatest of the trade union orators. Uh, so far. Um, he had eight children, uh, four daughters, four sons. Um, he spoke four languages. Uh, he traveled the globe. He was there at the topping out ceremony of the Brooklyn Bridge. Uh, he was involved in uh, the labor movements in Scotland and in Ireland, in South Africa. Uh, he spent 10 years organizing in New Zealand and Australia. He did two large tours before he was banned from America. Um, and he was many eight times in Russia, uh, touring Russia to help with the famine relief. And he was, uh, um, he went to China, as we would say, clandestinely. It, it wasn't known that he was in China, but he was there for six months. So the world that he was born into was essentially one of wood, and steam. Um, no workers had the vote. Um, no worker was educated. Trade unions were illegal. Uh, by the time he died in 1941, uh, it was a world of electricity and of metal. Um, great clashes of ideology. Workers had the vote. Legal trade unions that were leading the war effort against Hitler. So he oversaw enormous changes. And uh, one of the great changes was that when he'd been in Australia, most of his organizing was done on horseback. Uh, by the time he finished his days in the late thirties, he was flying to events. Um, early on in his life, he adopted Christian socialism and uh, we know how important this is in the formation of the labor movement, uh, Methodism. But he joined a grouping called the Swedenborg Christians, and they kind of emphasized unity. In fact, they believed that all Christian, all sects and all parts of Christian religion should be able to coexist under one roof. And in his, in his thinking, unity became very important. I said that he went down the, the, the mines at 10. This kind of started a lifelong obsession, really, with combating poverty. 
And he very quickly learned that he wasn't interested in just combating the symptoms of poverty, that he wanted to uproot it. And one of the ways that he wanted to uproot it, the principal way, was through the struggle for the shorter working week. This had an interesting effect on him because he took part in a great engineering strike, a national strike, which for the first time allowed workers to gain uh, a half day on Saturday. And so immediately he used that half day to enroll on all sorts of courses uh, and including with the Swedenborg Christians who taught him public speaking, uh, grammar, to write properly, um, the art of presentation. Um, and he became very active in this church to the point where at one point he was considering taking up the cloth, but he didn't. He didn't because uh, Christianity and religion saw poverty as an individualized, personalized uh, condition. Um, and Tom thought that, that you couldn't uh, cure poverty through changing your own personal behavior, through adopting a new moral code. And so he gravitated towards trade unionism. Uh, trade unionism saw poverty as a societal problem, um, one to be tackled collectively. And it allowed him to start to use the things that the Swedenborgs had taught him. He saw the limits of trade unionism, as he then thought, and adopted what was known in the 1880s and 1890s as gas and water socialism. Uh, this notion that working class people weren't yet ready to adopt socialism. And therefore, there had to be improvements like uh, um, putting in sewers, uh, clearing out the slums, educating people so that they would be able to handle the socialism w when it came along. Um, in fact, there are many great gains in this country as a result of this municipal socialism. And it's a time, a period when uh, wonderful steps forward were made in places like Bradford, Salford, Manchester, Birmingham, Bristol, uh, in terms of a whole new architecture uh, of municipal and civic life. People were going to the baths, they were going swimming, there were libraries being built. And it was a time of a, a great flowering uh, for, for working class people. This wasn't enough for Tom. And he thought that, that the way to conduct poverty, if it, if it wasn't through the cooperative movement or through the trade unions or through uh, religion, then there had to be government action. Um, and so he decided to go to Australia and he did this for a very specific reason, which was that he thought Australia was 10 years ahead of Britain. Uh, in fact, in some ways, it was 20 years ahead. The men and women got the vote 20 years before anyone in Britain. There was a, a Labour government in New Zealand and in parts of Australia 20 years before Britain. Uh, people voted on a Saturday so working class people uh, could vote. Um, and so he went out there, but he became uh, quite disillusioned. Um, so I'm going to stop the globe trotting bit there, but you can see how his thinking is starting to change. So he's saying, well, it's not an individual issue if we want to change society. It's a collective. How far can the trade unions do uh, make the changes? Well, they can socialize the workplace, but what about further out in the community, so he's gone to gas and water socialism, uh, but that's not enough. So it has to be a question of uh, workers voting to take uh, uh, the government. Um, Tom, uh, one of the things I said at the beginning was that I wanted to look at the essentials of his methodology. Uh, people that know Tom Mann are kind of blown away by his capacity for work and to have an impact uh, and to create change. Um, uh, how did he do it? Well, he didn't just kind of make things up on the hoof. He did develop a methodology and he did it 
in a kind of crucible um, of the most intense class conflict uh, in the country. And I'm going to come on to some of those conflicts that he was involved in that shaped his outfit in, in a moment. Tom uh, saw workers as struggling against poverty. So whereas today you might say, well, there are strikers and there are strike breakers, Tom didn't really differentiate between the two. He said that that was a, con a condition of their circumstance. Um, and so he always approached any work that he did with the aim of unifying people and bringing them in under one roof. Um, he thought that employers should only ever face one united working class body, that all workers could be in a union, that there, we could allow no division in the face of uh, um, the employer. Um, so therefore the unskilled and the semi-skilled should be in the union according to man, preferably in the same union, which you may want to talk about, uh, that men and women uh, should be in the same union, which was certainly not the case in, in most of his uh, lifetime. Uh, and of course, that workers from all backgrounds, black and white, young and old, should all be together. That the union in a way was a kind of community. And that the main thing was that the union should have the, the its prime role at a workplace level with workers representatives and tom is completely associated with the development of, of the shop stewards movement he thought there should only be one union per industry uh, or at worst a federation of unions within one industry so i don't know if we've got people here uh, from the health service for example or from education or even from elements of manufacturing where there's this great multiplicity of unions and unions often find difficulty of talking uh, with one voice. Um, he thought that unions were at the strongest when they were at the center of their community and that unions should have a vision that went well beyond the world of work. Uh, he thought that the unions couldn't rely on politicians I was asked the other day about uh, why Tom Mann didn't stand for Parliament. In fact, he did. And unfortunately, in his uh, case, he very nearly got elected when he didn't want to be. I think he was about 300 votes out. But he'd uh, played a role in, in the TUC in the 1890s. And believe it or not, Gladstone asked him to become the first ever Minister of Labour in Britain, and he turned him down. He was very suspicious of politicians, um, but he thought that unions had to be political. Um, he was a great organiser. And I think one of the things about him was that he was meticulous in his research. If you, if you read his speeches, they're an amazing portrayal of working life wherever he was. So there, there are instances, for example, um, the, the, the precursor of ICI was, uh, um, oh, what was it called? Bannermond, Bernamond in Northwich. And the conditions were very bad there. And he was sent by a newspaper to report on them. So he just basically put on the work clothes and walked and got himself a job in there so that he could report actively. When, when he was in Australia, the coal miners hid him in one of the cages and took him down the diamond mines to show him uh, uh, the conditions. And in, in Port Piri, when he was there organizing um, um, iron smelters, he actually donned the overalls and got jobs. So that he, he didn't just turn up on the job. He really knew um, the strengths of the workers because he'd studied the work processes and therefore the weaknesses of the employers. And he used these time and again um, to wrong foot employers and to pick periods to take action when the workers would be at their strongest and the employers would be at their weakest. Um, so I said I'd talk a little bit about 
the main strikes that he was involved in. You, you may have questions about these. They are not just the, so numerous, they are the turning point disputes in British Labour history. So he's, of course, very much involved with the match women's strike at Bryant and May in Bow. Um, he's one of the three principal leaders of the Great Dock Strike in 1889. Um, that Great Dock Strike was due to last for five weeks. Um, in fact, the union's money ran out after two. And the rest of the dispute, the last three weeks, was funded from Australia, who sent the equivalent of £4.8 million raised in uh, um, two weeks. Um, in fact, I, I was very honoured to speak, probably it's about two weeks ago now, at the Trades Hall in Broken Hill, which is a, a very important mining community in Australia. And the Trades Hall was due to be the first brick building built in Broken Hill. Um, and the stonemasons had saved funds for six years to build it. They'd, they'd raised £6,000 to build this brick building. Um, and instead, they sent the money to London for the dock strike. So that's the extent of the internationalism and solidarity that existed. And the Broken Hill trades hall wasn't built for another 10 years but when it was built um, the leaders of the dock strike went from london to australia to lay the first stones and you can see those stones now um, when the dispute was won there was this famous march of probably several hundred thousand east enders through to hyde park to celebrate and the dockers were led by uh, a, a guy with the sash carrying the Australian flag. The following year, 1890, was the Great Wharf Strike of Australia, and that was funded from London. So that showed the kind of interplay that existed. Uh, some years later, he's in Melbourne, and he, he fights what is called a free speech fight because there's no organising of unions unless you've got the right to hold meetings and to assemble. And he was imprisoned. Keir Hardy went out to Australia to show solidarity and visit him in, in the prison. In 1909, he led the most famous strike ever in Australia, which was the strike of the uh, lead, zinc and silver miners of Broken Hill. And he was arrested again for sedition he was banned from New South Wales. So the union set him up one metre over the state border in southern Australia and hired Tom Man trains throughout the strike. 4,000 people uh, uh, each time would go out to the state border where they would hear Tom speaking where he was legal to them inside uh, New South Wales. Um, it was an extraordinary uh, strike. It was a, a started as a, a lockout, and the um, members, the union uh, in, in Australia, they won. Uh, he returned to uh, Britain and led the famous syndicalist strike and the first ever general strike of transport workers on Merseyside. Churchill famously called him the dictator of Liverpool and sent a gunboat and 4,000 soldiers to occupy the city to try and break the strike, but they weren't able to. And this is kind of the legacy of Tom's life, these uh, great battles that are part of our history and part of the rationale behind our movement. Tom opposed World War I. Uh, he became effectively a revolutionary and a founder of the Communist Party. Um, he played a key role in 1920 as president of the hands off the Russian Revolution Committee. Um, Britain had troops about to attack Russia and uh, Lloyd George was the, the prime minister and Tom persuaded the TUC to threaten a general strike unless those troops were withdrawn. But he was going down to the docks as well, saying to the dockers, do not load the munitions ships. 
and effectively he won because those munition ships, famously the Jolly George, um, which was scuttled in the middle of the Thames, um, never was able to deliver the guns on board to the British troops. And in fact, the British troops were brought home. In 1926, Tom was sent abroad so that he was out of the country so that he could provide leadership if the strike movement uh, leaders were arrested. Uh, and then in 1927, he went to China for six months um, as part of a delegation to establish a trade union federation of um, effectively dockers and transport workers from uh, China, mainly Hong Kong and Shanghai, Indonesia, Malaysia, the Philippines, Australia, and the Pacific coast of America. And that federation was formed, and he is considered a father figure of the Chinese trade union movement as, as well. In 1934, he was arrested again for sedition for leading the unemployed. And, and at the age of 80, he volunteered to go to Spain to join the international brigades. Um, and he was blocked from doing that. But part of the buy-off was that the first international brigaders, many of them coal miners, uh, who fought in the English-speaking battalion, were fought, fought under the banner of the Tom Man Centuria. And there was a, 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 in the same year, there was a birthday party for him, uh, which has been called the, the broadest and most representative gathering of British labour ever. Um, uh, it had the Countess of Warwick, it had Ben Tillett, it had Clem Attlee, uh, you name it, they were there. And at the same time in Melbourne, there was a, a, an even bigger uh, celebration and the flag uh, um, on all the civic buildings in Victoria, uh, they flew the red flag. So this was an extent of the recognition um, of, of what he'd achieved. Um, I'm going to kind of stop there. Uh, Tom used to um, finish his speeches with, um, it, it was a, a, he would say three, three cheers for the revolution, hence the name of the book, Yours for the Revolution. But he would also say, um, don't clap me, go and think for yourselves. And I think that's a lovely way to kind of segue uh, me shutting up and you having the chance to speak. Um, his legacy. I think that when they went to clear his house, he had about two boxes of books and that was about it. All his mates were in the House of Lords. So you've got this amazing figure. He was a, a vegetarian who ran a chicken farm. He was a teetotaler who ran a pub. He was um, anti-war, but as an engineer, he made torpedoes. And as a Christian, he carried not one uh, uh, six gun, but two and used them in his own self-defense. So he's this kind of really rich character. And I, I finish off my book by saying, that the, the power of his ideas and the influence that he had uh, is unparalleled and puts him at the level of a kind of what we call in our movement, a pioneer along the lines of people like Robert Owen, Tom Paine, uh, Mary MacArthur, Eleanor Marks, really exceptional characters. Um, because he became a revolutionary, you won't find any statues um, the TUC very rarely speak about him, uh, and I'm busy going around lighting the embers wherever I go, and people are coming up with some very interesting proposals on how best to celebrate his life and to mark his uh, um, achievements. So there you go, Gawain. That's kind of, I think I was 19 minutes and 59 seconds there, wasn't I? Uh, and now we can go straight to questions and, and people can make... Uh, in their own interventions. Absolutely superb. Thank you, Phil. And uh, although I've heard you speak about Tom and about the book a number of times, I never tire of hearing these uh, incredible stories of this man who contributed so much in so many different ways to the movement in so many different um, places. Such a, such an exciting um, story. So I, as I said at the beginning, if you've got questions 
but Phil, please do place them in the chat and we'll call you in. Uh, we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll give you the power to unmute to ask your, uh, to ask your questions. So uh, we've got a couple of questions in the chat already, Phil. So okay. um, yeah. the, uh, the first one is from um, Victoria and I'm just going to find you in the list now, Victoria, and you should be able to unmute now and ask Phil your question. I can, I think I can see it there, Gawain. Is that, is that, um, it, it, it is Man's there. Opinion? I was going to give Victoria the opportunity to ask it, but I think she's struggling to unmute. We have sent a link to unmute, but if you can't, Victoria, then, ah, she's in a noisy public place. My apologies. I thought you meant the technology wouldn't let you. Okay. So, Victoria's question is what was Tom Mann's opinion of the breaking of the Triple Alliance in 1921 by the NUR? Um, well, I think I think you can imagine the the disappointment. He was involved at that time with the National Minority Movement, which he was president of it. And uh, one of the things that the Minority Movement did was to organise on a sectoral basis. So there were there was the Miners Minority Movement, the engineers, the docks, and the transport workers. And Tom. Um, to, very much towards the end of his working life, became general secretary of the Amalgamated Society of Engineers and brought eight unions together uh, in one uh, major federation. Um, and he'd had a similar impact on the uh, uh, rail workers it, back in 1910. And he'd been around when they'd adopted a kind of industrial unionist approach. So there was disappointment and there was anger um, and there was resolve. And uh, I think you'll find that although the Triple Alliance was broken, um, the rail workers did play a very significant role just a few years later in the general strike. Thanks, Phil. Um, our next question is from Education Southwest. You should be able to unmute now and uh, ask your question. So, so, sorry, Garling, I, I didn't rename myself. My name's Kevin Dawes. Uh, Welcome, Phil, Kevin. Phil, I'd like to thank you for your talk. It was really interesting. But I, I think one of the things it highlights, in a sense, is the fact that today we don't talk a lot about trade union history. It's not taught in schools. And dare I say, a lot of trade unions don't promote trade union history. And I didn't know whether you had any thoughts or ideas about how we overcome that and how we actually get that trade union history out there so pe people appreciate this rich history that we actually all share, even if we don't know about it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's intriguing, isn't it, that uh, we've got whole families in unions, but they didn't know that people like Tom Mann formed them. Um, you, you would at least be interested in if you lived in a, a community who the, the, the founding mothers and fathers were. Um, I, I've uh, just come back from Australia. It was a, a tiring but very rewarding uh, tour. I did 18 meetings. I did six in six cities in seven days. Um, and this issue kept on coming up. People, people would come up to me and say, how can we not know about this guy? And I said, well, if you imagine, it's not just you don't know about him. There are lots of other women leaders that are almost completely hidden from history. Um, so one, one of the things that's happened is that the Australian Manufacturing Workers Union has asked me to prepare uh, a, a series which they can use in their shop stewards and their district officer education that kind of talks about the history of internationalism and in particular about the impact uh, of Tom in, in Australia. So I think that that's, that's the first uh, point of call is that we can't ask others to educate us about uh, trade unionism if we're not doing it ourselves. I think the second thing is a question of the schools. 
Um, it's interesting that in, in Australia, um, they've never had this kind of anti-industrial um, uh, worker culture that we had shoved on us in the 70s and 80s, that they were dinosaurs, that these skills were no longer relevant. And and it, and the, the what they call tradies are still um, very much uh, respected in society, probably more than even than the professions. Um, so it, it's they they have working class education in their school curriculum. I mean, there's a lot of things they they should have, uh, like the history of the First Nation and Torres Straits people, which they ignore largely. Um, but they do have working class history and. You'll have Tom Mann streets in most of the big cities. Uh, one of the big theatres in Sydney is Tom Mann Theatre. All of the trade halls have uh, uh, Tom Mann rooms and murals. Um, so I think there's kind of a little bit of a flavour there of what can be done. Um, I was talking to people last night in Coventry. Uh, after the war, the Communist Party in Coventry set up a, like a trades hall, which was a, a social centre for trade unionists. And apparently it was a, a quite an impressive building, which was sold off in the 80s. But all that money is being held in a Tom Man trust. Um, so they're talking about doing uh, a, a conference, uh, some books, um, and also educational materials. So I'm going to be talking to Gawain about that. <laughs> Because I think that, I mean, people, you may uh, expect me to say this, but uh, of course, Tom Mann played a key role in the formation of the General Federation of Trade Unions. Uh, he was also uh, one of the founders of the Commonwealth TUC. Um, he was the founder of the International Transport and Workers Federation and was its first president. And that now has 660 affiliates and 19 million members. So... A lot of the things that Tom did weren't flash in the pans. They were, they really had substance. And I think there's a lot we could do to educate people around his achievements as well as his ideas. Absolutely, absolutely, Phil. And I think a theme we'll probably return to again this evening uh, about what we do around um, education and how we spread this this message of uh, Tom Mann's life and work uh, more broadly. Um, next question we've got, uh, well, there's a comment and a question from Gary McIntosh. Gary, uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now, maybe make your statement uh, and ask the question that you've got in the chat. That's great, Gawain. Hi, Phil. Thanks a lot for that. That was fantastic. I, um, can you hear me okay? Yeah, cool. We can. Yeah. We can. Yeah, yeah totally. Hi, good. Yeah, so just to put there a bit of statement as well, it's a real shame that uh, Tom Mann, an individual, for being such a force for good for the workers, has never really had the chance to be recognised and remembered in the world across the UK. Uh, it was nice to hear you saying so much stuff there about what how he's remembered and played. Um, basically, my question was along the, the lines of, you know, how was his time? Because um, he did make it hard day and the fact that William Gladstone had invited him to be involved in politics, but he was quite wary. But how was he regarded by the uh, the Labour Party and the formation of it? And how was how was his uh, influence and impact on somebody like Keir Hardy? Did they have a, quite a relationship with him? Or just general information like that would be great, Phil. Yeah, uh, happy to help there. Thanks, thanks for that point and for the question. Okay, so for the for the formation of the Labour Party itself, Tom was in Australia, um, and he'd had a bad experience with the Independent Labour Party. He was really very close to Keir Hardy. They were best buddies. Uh, Tom was uh, Keir's election agent, including in some of the battles in Aberdeen, by the way. Um, and Tom himself very nearly got elected in Aberdeen. I think he caught a fright there. So um, uh, Keir brought Tom to be the first general secretary of the ILP. And uh, he was uh, told to um, effectively draw up the first programme of social democracy in this country. And he drew up the ILP uh, uh, programme. 
And I think it was way too radical because the ILP was quite a broad church. So it had people like Ramsey MacDonald and Snowden, who later sold out the Labour movement. But it also had thoroughbreds like like uh, Keir Hardy. And, and Tom was very disillusioned that he'd written this programme. The programme had been adopted, but it wasn't ever with the intention of implementing it. And so he left the ILP. And that's when he started uh, uh, some itinerant work before he went to Australia. When he went to Australia, it's very interesting. Um, I mean, talking about Tom is exhausting. Uh, Gawain, you won't have heard this because these are many of the nuggets that I picked up in Australia. Um, he was taken on by, at first, not the unions as an organiser, but by the Labour Party to become its organiser. And out there, the Labour Party was very divided and, and it had what was called a white Australia policy, which was a complete denial of the First Nation people's existence and that all immigration should be coming from basically from England, Scotland, uh, Wales and, and Ireland. And Tom didn't like that at all. And it's the start of his understanding of colonialism and anti-racism. And so he never really broke with the Labour Party, but he formed the Victorian Socialist Party, which was this extraordinary uh, semi-revolutionary, semi-Labour type party um, that, that became very influential in Australian politics. People still talk openly about the Victorian uh, Socialist Party. Um, he went to Victoria and was given a budget and, and the problem facing the Labour Party in Australia, in, in the Victoria area, it had 10 branches and they were all in Melbourne. So they took Tom on to go into the rural areas, which were uh, small farmers, agricultural labourers and miners to build the Labour Party. And in the space of 26 weeks, um, traveling largely by horseback and horse and car, he formed 82 branches of the Labour Party. And uh, its vote in 1901 was 8% in Victoria. In 1903, it was 28%. So the whole of the origin of the Labour Party in, in Australia and in, in its heartland, which is Victoria, um, you know, that when I was doing meetings, people were saying that their branches of the Labour Party were actually formed by Tom Mann. Uh, um, in, 18, in the mid-1880s, he, he was very close to um, uh, William Morris, and they fought a free speech fight in um, uh, the East End of London. Uh, and uh, then Tom replicated that in Melbourne, in 1905 and was imprisoned and there was a big campaign to get him out and Keir Hardy actually went to Australia to visit him in in the prison as did Ramsay MacDonald and interestingly when he was when Tom was uh, uh, put on trial for sedition in 1934 at the age of 78 and sent to prison in Brixton Ramsay MacDonald who had visited him in an act of solidarity in Melbourne in 1906, was the prime minister who imprisoned him and kept him in prison in 1934. So it's a funny old world. But Tom had this checkered history, but he never built, he never burnt his bridges. One of the things that's beautiful about Tom Mann, um, which I think we really could learn a lot from these days, is to learn how to disagree with each other without taking out the opponent. And so when you have that party in Melbourne and the parties in, in London to celebrate his birthday, is every wing of the Labour movement was there. And, and even though he got up in the middle of the, the, the London meeting and sang the song of the Red Army in Russian, uh, I think probably much to Attlee's embarrassment, um, people still were happy to be pictured by the side of him. Uh, so Tom Mann has got a very important role in not just 
the Labour Party in, in England, but the Labour Party in, in uh, Australia as well. Fantastic. And I, I hadn't heard that uh, that last um, anecdote. So no, um, very, very interesting. There's always more to learn about about Tom Mann, isn't there? It's, uh, it's fascinating. Our next question is from um, Christopher Butler. Christopher, you should be able to unmute now and ask your Yes, question. thank you. That was great. Well, absolutely great. I read your book with, with a great deal of interest. Um, okay. I'm actually thank speaking you. to you from uh, from Bradford, the birthplace of the ILP, of course. Um, we've got a long tradition of, of supporting the ILP. Yeah. Before I ask my question, I'd just like to comment on Tom Mann's attitude to multiple trade unions in a single industry. I mean, I agree entirely with him that this causes all kinds of problems, the different trade unions taking different attitudes to, to similar problems. And I think this underlines the importance of trade councils that where multiple trade unions come together, you can produce a, a common ground, which doesn't exist with the, the single trade unions in, in, in the industry. Uh, my question is about Tom Mann's attitude to single syndicalism, um, something I'm very interested in myself. And I just wondered if you could say more about his attitude to that, please. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, greetings to Bradford as well. So, so Tom, um, He's associated with syndicalism because of the Industrial Syndicalist Education League that he helped to found, which I'm sure you know about. Um, I, I understand that I'm going to be given a chance to write a second edition of the book. And one of the areas that I'm going to do a lot more work on is on syndicalism. And there's a reason why. There's this mythology that he kind of comes back from Australia um, and he goes to Paris and he meets these uh, uh, syndicalists in Paris and comes back to England as a convinced syndicalist. That's just completely false. Um, he, he, his syndicalism starts in Australia, which is a bedrock of industrial unionism. Um, and I think that the, uh, uh, he comes, he, he's, he's in, um, I think he's in New South Wales uh, for a period, and then he's in Melbourne. And in Melbourne, he starts a correspondence with Big Bill Hayward, who was the leader of the Western Miners Federation in America and was a wobbly. Um, and uh, he strikes up a pen friendship and then late, in later years, a great personal friendship with George Hardy, who became General Secretary of the IWW, who was an Englishman. And Tom starts this exchange um, about the shortcomings of trade unions, um, about the use of uh, general strikes and mass strikes um, to, to further an industrial agenda, um, the distrust of politicians, uh, the belief, which I must say I share quite a bit of, which is that trade unions could be much more political and could carve out some of the space that's currently occupied by employers with ex exploitation by imposing the eight hour day unions could drag a lot of that space back um and and tom and another area that i'll write more on is that this what i've said was that tom goes from christianity to trade unionism to municipal socialism to social democracy and then to industrial unionism and revolutionary politics but it's not kind of black and white ever with him. And, and you actually find him uh, uh, speaking as late as 1920 about Jesus, the communist. So he, he brings the elements of his previous thoughts through. And one of the areas that needs more research is on the question of syndicalism, because, again, people say, oh, well, Tom jettisoned syndicalism and went for Marxism. Actually, he went for Marxism, but he brought the syndicalism in and the kind of rank and file movements that he'd helped to grow in, in the period around 1910 to 1914, uh, around the Miners' Next Step and, and with, the, with the Clyde Workers' Committees. He brought that into the Communist Party and that became the industrial machinery and very much an outlook uh, of... Um, the CP's industrial strategy. 
One other area that's in my book that's nowhere else, um, partly I stumbled on it, was that Tom, of course, was the best known syndicalist in the world. And suddenly he's gone to Russia to meet Lenin and he's become a leader of the pro-Russian Red International of Labour Unions. But because of his background, he's, he's, he knows all of the, the continental syndicalists, literally by their first name. And so Lenin asks Tom to try, first of all, to bring the syndicalists into the Red International of Labour Unions rather than set their own up which he did successfully. And then they used him in secret negotiations between the second international and the third international to see if they could still keep everybody within one, uh, uh, one organization, which they were unable, to, which he was unable to do. But I don't think Tom ever lost his um, support for rank and file, self-organization, based on the workshop with trade unions that were capable of doing an awful lot more than we think that they are. And I'd like to see some of that syndicalist tradition. I think there's a bit of it in organizations like Strike Map. There's an echo of it. Um, uh, I'd like to see us uh, promoting that much more as a, as a trade union response to the, the crisis at, at, at the moment. So I don't know if that answers your question. I think that a lot of people say uh, syndicalism in Britain, origin French, existed 1910 to 1914, washed away by, by the First World War. As, as somebody would say, that's fake news. It's just not right. Uh, in fact, it has its roots right early on in, in the 20th century, and it extends right the way through to the way that the Communist Party was organizing, for example, in the 1970s, in the docks, in the engineering industries. And, and I guess, I suppose now, Gawain, you'd call them broad left kind of organizations, wouldn't you? But they're, yeah. they're very similar to those rank and file movements. Yeah. Did that part answer your question? Sorry, I've, uh, I had had removed the, the, the right to strike the right to speak from your question so I'm not able to answer but I hope I hope that did cover uh the the uh, questions that were raised. The next um the next question we've got is from um Gavin McCann. Um now um Gavin's writing a history of um trade union education uh yeah. and is interested in um in asking a question in relation to that. So I'm just going to we go, Gavin. You should be able to unmute now and speak directly to Phil. Brilliant, lad. Can you hear me, Phil? Yeah, by all means. Yeah, fire Brilliant. away, Gavin. Thank you very much. That was super. Really enjoyed that. It was really interesting. Um, yeah, as Gawain was saying, I'm I'm researching trade union history uh, in relation to education, and I'm really interested by Tom Mann. I'd I'd, I'd heard before about his early life that his union had uh, had won the right for reduced hours. And he used that to educate himself. And and then I've, I am aware that when he campaigns for the eight hour week, uh, eight uh, hour day, sorry, he um, he talks about education uh, being the consequence of it. So I just wanted to know to what extent his self-education, the fact that he taught himself and how the union fought for that, did, did that affect him and the way that he viewed trade unions and the role that trade unions will have directly? I, I think the simple answer is, Gavin, massively. Mm. And the more that I wrote the book, the more this autodidactic culture uh, came through. By the way, when you're doing your research for your, 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 for your book, do look in some detail at the engineering unions. Um, there's a book by James Jeffrey, which is the history of the engineers. It's very important. Um, basically, there was very little education around and the engineers were highly skilled craft workers. So they, they, could, they were working to a fraction of, of an, a, a millimeter effectively making screws before there was machinery or mass machinery to do that. 
and there was an expectation of the craft craftsman engineer, which Tom became, that you were highly educated. Um, there, there's a book, it's one of my all-time favourites, called Solo Trumpet. Um, and, uh, oh gosh, now the name's gone out, out of my head. I, 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 it'll come to me. And um, it, to, Tommy Jackson. And uh, he describes um, being apprenticed in Fleet Street to the job that I was doing uh, in the National Graphical Association. And he said that at lunchtime, you would go down to the Thames outside Fleet Street and there would just be hundreds of print workers reading Dickens uh, with a dictionary in the other hand. So there was this powerful impetus to be uh, respected for your intellect uh, and for your contribution to society. And, and in the engineers, that was very strong. It was particularly strong amongst coal miners in Britain. And some of the great municipal libraries were built by the union movement. Um, so I would say it, it gave him the opportunity because it gave him the time off. And Tom set up the Shakespeare Mutual Improvement Society um, around the 1880s, 1890s were these uh, radical clubs and they were largely about self-education. Um, uh, there was a very big one in Stratford near where I used to was brought up and, and it would have a thousand people on a Sunday listening to lectures like what is electricity. And, and Tom used to do a lot of these lectures himself because with some of his time off, he enrolled straight away on a course at the British Museum where he was allowed to dissect uh, meteorites. And he became uh, very knowledgeable about uh, um, astronomy, um, partly because in those days, in his early years, ships navigated by the, by the stars, as well as by maps as a, as a sort of security thing. So it gave him the opportunity to, to study. Um, and like most skilled workers, he grabbed it. Um, I I didn't do much work on his attitude towards the plebs league, and I think you could do well to have a look at that area, um, which were these uh, radical uh, self education clubs based on the unions, um, and they formed, of course, Ruskin College in in Oxford. So plenty there for you to look into. Um, but yeah, Tom, Tom said. Now, can I just, uh, I'm going to, give me one second, if you don't mind. I'll just uh, fill in while Bill's gone to go and uh, collect something of interest, no doubt, by saying that I've posted the link in the um, chat for those who are interested in purchasing a copy of the book. It's on sale at the publishers now, and the link is there in the chat. Um Phil, I've been covering for you. So, what did you go to Thank get? you. This, this, these are some uh, pointers for Graham. So, Tom, these are some quotes that Tom, Tom said of uh, trade unions, that they should become centres of enlightenment and not merely the meeting place for paying contributions. So he thought that unions should be um, uh, effectively um, in charge of culture and education within communities. He also said, without trade unions, no living wage or shortening of the hours of labour can be expected. By this struggle, however, the exploitation of labour will only be lessened, but not abolished. The exploitation of labour can only be done away with entirely when society has taken control of all the means of production, including the land and the means of distribution. And that he, he's, he, for him, um, this is back to the, the question of syndicalism. Um, so eight hours, the eight hour day is, is shrouded in bullshit and mythology. In the hands of Tom Mann, it was eight hours rest uh, eight hours work, and then what he said was eight hours for the res restitution and reconstruction of family, community, and nation. So what you've got there is effectively the outer contours of a, a British definition of what is socialism. 
because if you if you apply his schema, uh, you've got a very different looking society from the one that you've got now, and you really start to drive back uh, poverty. And he said, um, in terms of the ideology of unions, recognition and adoption of the principle and practice of association as against isolation, of cooperation as against competition, of concerted action in the interests of all, instead of each take for himself and the devil take the hindmost. And I think that that's wherever he went, that was the kind of message. Um, we're very lucky. I don't know how we did this, but uh, we laid hold of uh, a transcript of his speeches, strike speeches in Broken Hill. Um, the Coal Miners Union is going to reproduce that for its shop stewards. And uh, they are effectively along those lines, which is that um, there's two ways of looking at life. There's devil take the hindmost and the dog eat the dog. And then, or you can stick together. Um, and that was Tom's way. I don't know if that answered your question. Hopefully, hopefully plenty of food, food for thought there for, uh, for, for Gavin. Um, I'm, before I bring in our next um, question, Phil, uh, we've got a, a fantastic comment in the chat here from Marion Mann, and I'm just going to read it out if that's okay. Oh, wow, uh, yeah. Marion says, I can't thank you enough, Phil, for a thoroughly heartwarming presentation about my grandfather. Sadly, I never knew him. He died 14 years before I was born. My father, Charles Charlie Mann, was born in 1905 in Melbourne. And after his death, I too spent time in Australia, including visiting Broken Hill and the Tom Mann Theatre in Sydney. I've been a trade union activist all my working life, now retired and spending a lot of time in Spain, somewhat obsessed with learning about the Civil War. Very much looking forward to the book and excited to learn there will be more developments to commemorate his legacy. I would love to be involved. I have several of Tom's books that I inherited that you may be interested in. That's so uh, I think we, we maybe need to make sure, uh, Marion, that we can get um, you and Phil linked up uh, following that would the be meeting wonderful. and, and, uh, and, and wonderful. get a proper discussion. Uh, Marion, I don't know if, if you wanted to comment at all. I'm going to... Uh, just uh, scroll down and give you the opportunity to unmute if you'd like. Don't feel under any obligation, but if you'd like, you're now able to unmute and uh, if you want to say anything. Yes, thank thank you very much. I, I'm I'm quite overwhelmed, frankly, to uh, have heard and you've done far more research than I have. I thought I'd done quite a lot into his life, but you are so knowledgeable. It's just brilliant. So. Uh, I am quite overwhelmed. I'm quite touched, actually. And his legacy, I say, I've been a trade union activist all my life. I've been in and out of the Labour Party, absolutely horrified with it. I'm very much aware of his um, work with the ILP and, and so on. And it, it's, I say, heartwarming. Is it, It's quite emotional to know that his work that he did is now seems to be being recognised and it's just fantastic. So thank you very, very much. That's great. It's, a, it's an honour, absolute honour. Uh, I'm, I'm going to say something more, Marion, that may surprise you if I may. Um, so after 1936, Tom started to get unwell and, and uh, there's correspondence with Harry Pollitt, who was the General Secretary of the Communist Party, um, trying to get some of the best treatment for him uh, and also a helper as well. Um, and Tom decided that he wanted to go over to training. And so there are some great photographs of him. In fact, there's one of him doing a, a race um, with Willie Gallagher at a youth camp in 1938. That's, that's not bad going by any standards. But Tom uh, went over to training and education. And I've done some research. I'm going to do a little bit more. But if you look at the industries that were nationalized or created 
between 1945 and 1951. So you're talking about rail, uh, coastal and road transport, creation of the education system, health, coal mining, electricity. They were all nationalized. If you look at the unions that were um, involved in those nationalizations um, in quite some detail, actually, they were pretty much all had general secretaries and presidents that had been through Tom Mann's uh, training schools. So he was involved with the greatest leap forward that, that, that we had. Um, I came into activism around 1974. Um, and then, of course, 10 years later was the great miners strike that took over my life. Uh, uh, for a year, I ended up in the cells twice. So I don't recommend that to anybody. And then uh, two years after that, with the printer's strike, which was my own industry. And I look on those two as defeats, but honourable defeats. People fought an amazing sacrifices. But there was another defeat that was dishonourable. And this was uh, the reaction of the TUC to Thatcherism. Up until that time, the TUC had 14 industrial trade groups where, for example, in health, you would have four or five unions and they had to work together and they had to develop policy for the future. So there were no government surprises. The trade unions had the answers because they were developing ideas all the time. That structure was broken down. It was called old fashioned. It wasn't up to the new uh, global way of doing industry. Um, but what it means is that we now don't have spaces where unions put aside their competition and come together to talk about what the, their members need as workers. Uh, the green transition, artificial intelligence, who, how are we gonna solve the crisis in elderly and social care. Um, that structure in 1984 was the Tom Mann structure, which is just an amazing achievement that somebody that died in 1941 can pen a structure that lasted all the way through the war, through the Cold War, through the 60s heydays, through the 70s retrenchment, right up to the point where Thatcher was able to defeat it. Um, I think that's just an amazing achievement. I also think, and I'm arguing in all of my meetings, that unless we return to that structure, we won't have a voice at the table. The big issues now are being dealt with over the heads of working class people, when in fact we could be organized in trade unions and be the best voice because we're the ones that, that run those services. We are those people. Anyway, it's fantastic to share the room with you, Marion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Marion, for joining us and for uh, contributing. Really, really special. Um, okay, I'm gonna move now to our um, next question. Uh, the next question is from Christina. And Christina, I wondered you've also commented in the um, in the chat as well as putting a question in the um, Q and A. So, if I uh, give you the opportunity to unmute now, you might want to share your comment from the chat as well as your question. Christina, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Ron. I I will say, <laughs> hearing what Phil was saying about some man, I didn't have an idea of whom Tom Mann was. And I would say I've been a trade union nearly all my life. When the Nago was around, I was there. But nobody actually gave us this history or some sort of said anything about the past leaders that we should be celebrating today. So hearing you what Tom Mann did, I was really moved, and I'll tell you that when I hear things like this, it actually makes me to be more militant, to be more determined 
that's Tom awesome. would be very happy with that, Christina. <laughs> Let me tell you, it's really, really, really interesting and moving, and I wish that um, that type of history, like tribunal history, should be taught in schools. It's not. It's not, it's not to be political, just to train the young minds that they needed to, to be interested in community activity and they needed to actually continue to work for the good, for the good of everybody. Because that is what I see trade unions are doing. And that is what I said, get my interest up. And I will say, I can't thank you enough. You delivered the, the speech very well. And I pray that status of um, some man will be somewhere where people could be referring to, or people could go near it anytime, maybe during summer, you go and sit down in the park to say, this is the person. Because I think he had achieved a lot, and he had laid foundation to what we are today as trade unionists. Thank you. Thank you. Mm. Thanks very I, much, Christina. Oh, sorry, Phil. I, I don't think there's any answer to that. I think that was a great point. Yeah, it's terrific. Absolutely. I mean, they're, they're, I don't know, Christina, of a single statue that exists for Tom. There's certainly a beautiful bust, but no one knows where it is. Um, there, it, it's interesting that he was considered. I mean, the, the, the testimonials about his power of oratory. Um, at, at one point, for example, when he was in Melbourne, um, he never had much money. And I forgot to say that he was an accomplished violinist. And so him and Elsie um, hired one of the biggest halls. It took 4,000 people. And each Sunday they would do a performance because she was a very uh, uh, respected singer. And Tom would give a lecture and a speech and then people would make a donation and that's how they could uh, um, uh, survive. But there's, the, as far as we know, there are no recordings of his voice, which I think is really tragic. There's supposed to be two tapes somewhere that were done in late 1938 by Donna Tor but I've never been able to track them down. Everybody knows where knows about them, but no one knows where they are. Um, I, I, you know, so I, I did, in terms of symbolism, I, there was a badge struck by the Communist Party a year after he died. It's a beautiful badge, uh, yours for socialism, and, it, and it's got a relief of his face. And I finally managed to track one down and took it out as a gift for the Sydney Trades Hall. Um, but, but, you know, there's, there's, there's not a lot of symbolism. But I think probably Tom would say, forget about symbolism, get on with the education courses. <laughs> not, not a lot of symbolism, but Gavin points out in the, um, in the chat that there is a bust in Warwick University Modern Records uh -huh. Office. Okay, that's so, the one. Uh, then. Yeah. And there's a link here. So, so uh, yeah, this can be um, can be tracked Great down. Stuff. I'm sure. Our Thank next you, question Gavin. is from Louisa Morgan. Louisa, I'm allowing you to unmute now. Okay. Good evening, Hi. Phil. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for for you. for your talk. Um, I I when I lived in Germany, that is where I first came across Thomas Mann. Uh, in in, uh, in German, there's a book which was about to, to do with the Communist Union, at the um, because you know Germans are very they active trade union activists, but I never thought of union activists until the past twenty years when I joined PCS. Um, who what what I want to see now, and and I, I've read a lot. I've been doing through through my study of employment law. I started the diploma reading a lot about the history of trade unionism in the UK. And I've been to, to the library in London and came across, because I, I knew my mother, she was one of the Pan-Africanists 
in, in, okay. in Nigeria with Nkrumah, and they were all influenced by Thomas Mann. Yeah. And um, which was, which, you know, it, and so while I was doing my research, I came across trade union activism in Nigeria and in Ghana going back during colonial times. And because because they were influenced by Thomas Mann, you yeah. know, yeah. and so in today's modern world, and because of education, because my grandmother used to say you could have all the wealth in the world, in the world, and it doesn't matter what you're born into or who you are, if you don't have that certificate, which means if you don't have that education, you wouldn't be able to do anything for anyone in this world. And when I look at the trade union movement today in this country, I find that um, I'm, I'm on the TUC, I represent equity, one of my other unions uh, on the race relations committee. When I look at the race, uh, at the TUC, at all the trade union movements today, I can say that we are lucky in equity to have uh, Paul Fleming as our general secretary. Unlike former uh, equity uh, trade union uh, uh, general secretaries, they never campaigned. Paul does. And I'm, I'm also a member of uh, a P I'm PCS. I'm on the PCS, a retired member of the PCS, my first proper trade union in this country. Um, I found that um, the, the TUC and our, us, our Welsh General Secretary was nurtured by the PCS in Wales. So I am one of the ones who piloted the Welsh, uh, the Black uh, Trade Unionist act, um, Activist uh, campaign. So I can't honestly say that I can see any trade union um, members or, or activists who are like Tom Mann. The only person I can think of is Nelson Mandela, you know, but in, in the UK today, who would you think, who would you, would you give that title of being a, a, a modern Thomas Mann? And how can we campaign for a blue plaque for that man who did great things who pushed for educating, for education, 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 because as far as I'm concerned, he was the father of educating trade union activists. And that is why uh, even in my seventies, I believe in education. And last year during COVID, I was doing so many trade union courses. You won't believe it, and I will tell you. Fantastic. And I am passionate Fantastic. about education because education empowers you. It's empowered you. to be there. And I believe the other lady who spoke, she must, I know she's African, but I don't know, she sounded either like Nigerian or Ghanaian, but we were, the, uh, the Pan-Africanists Pan -Africans were great educationalists. But mm -hmm. in today's climate, it's all about greed. It's all about mm -hmm. self, self, self. I, and well, I think, we uh, need can, I, to, can I just say to you there, I, I mean, I, I think that that's, I think, I think you'd be interested in the book because one of the things that I, I say is that um, probably Tom would, there, you asked me about who, who uh, is exceptional. Um, probably Tom would say, go and look at the 2022, 23 strike movement at many of the sort of rank and file activists um, who were some of them new to to trade unionism, but who st stood out and took a leadership role, and I think that that would be where he would say he probably wouldn't say look at the top. He would say look at the at the bottom. Um, I think you have to accept that Tom was an exceptional person, but a product of exceptional circumstances as well, and because. Um, because of his early achievements, don't forget, they said that the dockers could not be organized. They were the most precarious of workers. And yet he showed that there was a way 
to create this mighty force that lasted. But what that meant was that he never had to introduce himself from the outside to, do, to other people's struggles, that he was always being called in. So, for example, in the Dublin lockout, he's working with James Connolly. Um, we, uh, in, the, uh, in, in Russia in 1921, the president of Russia invites him to tour for six months to give speeches to agitate the areas um, uh, where there's famine. He's always been called in, and uh, that means that he's called to where, he's, where the workers most need him at any particular time. And that forges a very particular kind of person. Uh, I think the thing about Tom that, in, for me personally, because I've been through quite a bit myself, but the thing that impresses me most about him is this beautiful humility. Um, he, he, when he went to Australia, so that he stuck out, he started wearing a white suit with a big white hat. Um, so that everybody could re readily recognize him. Uh, and then he would give these amazing speeches. Um, but he never asked for anything for himself. Um, uh, there are descriptions of him on the campaign trail in driving rain and frozen ice. Um, and he, he put up with great hardship through his life. And unlike his friends, who he stayed friends with, didn't end up in the House of Lords with a big home. He, he, he was loved by the people, and I think that that was a special uh, characteristic for him. Um, so, yeah, that, that's some ideas. I mean, one, one of the things that is interesting about the British Labour movement is we don't have these big statues. You basically do what you can, and then you die and everybody forgets you. And uh, I can't quite like that option. Um, but I think with Tom, uh, we need to engage with his ideas because there's so much, he is so much a person of this time um, that, that he has got the answers to many of the questions that in our trade union movement we're struggling with. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, we're going to be finishing in, in a couple of minutes' time, but I think we've got time to just squeeze one last question in. Um, and that question is from Marie. So, Marie, I'm going to uh, give you permission to unmute now and you can put your question directly to Phil. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Yes, I think you partly answered my question, but I wondered what, uh, first of all, how long Tom Mann spent in France? You said that he um, spoke four languages, so I don't know whether one of them was French. Yes, and also, it was. Um, okay. <laughs> and so, um, what what would he what was he thinking about, or what were his thoughts on the Chartes d'Amiens in 1906 when the French unions decided to kind of split well I'm simplifying a lot but split from political parties because when I came to the UK I found it incredible that unions could be affiliated to a political that might sound naive but I thought that was a very strange idea even though in practice the CGT was always quite close to the communist party in France so I was wondering what what he made of all this um basically but I think you partly answered my question when you talked about syndicalism earlier on so yeah. Thank you for your answer. Yeah. Uh, Marie, just before you go, though, so um, think about the world in uh, around 1890 to 1900. Um, Tom did all this work without a smartphone. Um, but what he did have was the docking system that existed all around the world. And they formed this Dockers International. I was intrigued, you know, if, if the Australians were paying £4.8 million pound in two weeks, um, how did they get it from Australia to London? And I found out that the Australian unions had a bank, uh, a bank account in, in London, and that's how the money was got over. So these people were in dialogue constantly. 
And then very quickly, you start to get the uh, the ticker tape, you know, where you, you can talk on a telegraph. Um, and so he was in constant contact. And one of the most important uh, uh, sections of the Dockers Union were, were the French. And Tom went there quite a few times. He was expelled from France quite a few times. Um, at one point, he was expelled from Sweden, Switzerland, and from France in the same six-month period. Uh, the answer, the, the, the way of the authorities was to get him out of the way as quick as possible. Um, but I think he would have been, he, he, you know, th this idea of trade unions affiliating to Labour uh, is fairly rare. Um, and uh, it exists in, in Australia and, and it exists in Britain and can be a source of great strength. Um, uh, but I, and so I think that, like I said, he, he was very sceptical of parliament. Um, he was very sceptical of politicians who he thought were only interested in labor issues um, uh, at election time, whereas trade unions had to be interested in labor issues or work issues all the time, otherwise they had no meaning. Um, and so he was quite comfortable with trade unions that were or weren't affiliated, but he thought that unions had to be much more political. Uh, and if I can just finish by saying, because this might interest some of the uh, um, uh, viewers, um, well, of course, we've got Gawain in the chair and Tom Mann helped to form the GFTU that Gawain's now the General Secretary of. But I can tell you, for example, that the General Municipal and Boilermakers Union is an amalgamation, not just in the Tom Mann model, but is involved in trade, involved trade unions uh, that Tom paid to start the trade unions out of his own savings. Unions like the Workers Union. Um, that unite, uh, that, that he created the engineering union out of eight unions. That went on to form Amicus with the Transport and General Workers Union that included the Dockers Union that Tom formed with Ben Tillett. And now Unite is an amalgamation of the engineers, the electricians, and the Transport and General Workers Union. And this story is replicated a, a, a not, not only across uh, Australia, but in some of the American unions as well, where he had an influence in starting those unions. So the legacy is very rich. And uh, I think that some of the ideas are the ideas of the time. So I would urge you to read, have a look at the book. Um, I think it's on discount for people that are attending this evening, isn't it, Gawain? I think Manifesto have made it available as- It is, a there's, a, there's a discount as part of the uh, speaking tour. So the link in a chat, if people follow that, they'll be able to um, to purchase a copy of, of the book at a discount. So. Um, and, and enable them to uh, to learn more about this this fantastic character. Um, thanks so much, Phil. Um, I've, I've I've learned a lot in this session. Absolutely superb. It always is um, hearing you talk about Tom Man. And um, uh, there's just so much I think we can take from Tom Man's life, Tom Man's example that we can take forward in our own work about as trade unionists, whether that's his incredible examples of international solidarity, his examples of building unity across the movement and bringing unions together on an industrial basis um, in order to win for their members and for the wider working class. Because of course, that's a key point. It was never just about the group of workers he was organizing. It was about organizing the class as a whole, wasn't mm. it? Absolutely. Um, any final comments from you before we finish this evening, Phil? No, but just how how um, nice it was to have engagement and to be able to discuss. I hope that I was able to answer the questions to the best of my ability. And I'm doing another talk in a few weeks time on the great dock strike of 1889. So hopefully people will come back and, and listen to that take part fantastic so our next our next um trade union and working class history session as phil said will be taking place in may it's on the 21st of may when we've got phil coming back 
to uh, speak to us about the great dock strike. Um, there's a couple of people in the chat, Gavin, I know, um, uh, who would like to be in touch, Phil, and I'm sure okay, we can I'm arrange that. I'm just sending Gavin my uh, email address. Fantastic. And uh, we've got details for everyone who signed up, so we'll be able to make sure you're linked up. And Marion as well, if that's okay, we'll be in touch with yeah, you. Yeah, that would be to, fantastic. Uh, to arrange a connection. Thank you for everyone who's that's joined great. this evening. Thank you so much to Phil for um, for your fantastic contribution. I'm looking forward to the next session in a month's time. And uh, I guess we should probably end with uh, thanks to Tom Mann for the uh, inspiring Absolutely. example that he provides for our work. Uh, yours for the revolution. Yours for the revolution. Thank you. Take care, Gawain. Good night, everybody.